Welcome and thank you for stopping by Sheila's Audiobooks and I am Sheila. This recording is coming from South Texas. All stories on this recording are in the public domain for United States copyright law. These stories were first published around April 1910. They are about Lord Lister called John C. Raffles the most brilliant among all thieves. He is the terror of usurers and money lenders, robs them of their possessions by his wiles, protecting beleaguered innocents and supporting the needy. Man of honor in all respects. He persuaded that many abuses, protected by law, continue to proliferate with impunity. Every effort is made to apprehend Lord Lister, called John C. Raffles, the most brilliant of thieves. Reward, £1,000 sterling. Chapter 1. The Legacy of the Dying. The last rays of the setting sun fell into a cramped roof room in a tenement in Whitechapel, one of the poorest areas in London. On a shabby couch, in the corner beside the window, lay a man, who turned from side to side, propped up. Although the whole arrangement betrayed great poverty, neatness and order reigned in the narrow space. And whatever warming garments were available had been used to make the patient as bearable as possible in bed. An empty chest had been placed next to the bed and on it stood, in a broken water glass, a small bouquet of violets. A slight movement at the door suddenly startled the sick person, but all remained calm, and disappointed he laid his head back on the pillow. Still nothing, he murmured, and the deep fear of his child wandering unprotected in the streets of London made his heart cringe. In his imagination he saw Ellen, who was loved above all else, going through the streets to prolong her father's life with the small profit she made from the sale of flowers. And doubly tall he imagined in his fever fantasies the dangers to which a young girl in the streets of London is exposed. Then again a smile crossed the sunken cheeks of the sick man. The sweet fragrance of the violets reminded him how his daughter, in spite of sorrow and misery, always found ways to bring him home a token of her love. He was breathing heavily and irregularly, his eyelids locked tight. There the door was opened softly, and in the dark a pair of black eyes glittered, and they rested on the wretched bed. Sweetly, almost inaudibly, someone entered, whose figure was completely covered by a long black cloak. A broad-brimmed hat hid the face, which was surrounded by a full beard, and only the devilishly flickering eyes revived the ghostly figure. Slowly the stranger moved to the bed, keeping a close eye on the sick person. Suddenly a beam of light flickered and shone upon the face of the sick man. In the light of the electric flashlight a great scar could be clearly seen on the face of the ominous guest, which stretched from the right temple to the corner of his mouth. One brief moment was enough, the stranger had seen enough. Death already cast its shadow on the sunken face. Well, it's finally coming to an end, hissed the hair-raising fellow. Praise be to the devil. I'll come at the right moment. He looked around for a moment to convince himself that he was really alone, and then bent over the sick man. A grievous groan escaped him, as if he sensed the closeness of his enemy. Lightning fast the stranger bent down in a corner at the head of the bed. The patient exclaimed convulsively. Ellen, come, come quickly, it is coming to an end. Almost inaudibly the last words died away, and his head sank against the damp wall with a gurgling sound. After a few moments the mysterious shadows emerged from the darkness again. He must be here. Where has he hidden it now? As he uttered these words, the stranger's fingers felt over the sick man's emaciated hands, which lay trembling feverishly on an old cloak that served as a blanket. Nothing, nothing. But I must have him, if I should tear his heart out. At this moment the creak of the worm-eaten stairway betrayed that someone was coming up. With a great curse the stranger sprang to the door and was instantly gone into the darkness of the portal. A moment later a young girl crept into the room, approached the sick bed, and knelt before it. Father, dear father, how are you? She spoke only half loudly, and kissed the emaciated hand. The sick man awoke from his feverish slumber, and laying his trembling right hand affectionately on the young girl's head, he whispered. Light up, child, then I can see your sweet eyes once more, for it will soon come to an end. No, dear father, you must not leave me. Light up, it's so dark. With a stifled sigh the girl rose and lit the end of the candle which was angled in the neck of a bottle. 
Her figure could now be seen in that flickering light. Middle-sized, slender yet stout figure, she appeared to be about seventeen years old. Her countenance gave her great charm. An oval face, a small mouth, a wave of black locks, and above all a pair of large, deep blue eyes with long lashes. She was somewhat dark in complexion. As the girl lit up, the patient tried to get up, but fell back under painful support. Quickly Ellen rushed to the bed, and begged. Stay still, dear father. Now go get some sleep that will do you good. I will watch over you. Look, here I have something for you that will help you. With these words she opened a package which she had put on the table when she entered, and took out a bottle of wine. Child, Ellen, how do you come to that? You won't waste the few shillings you earn on this, will you? I don't use anything any more, because it ends with me. And now wine, baby, how is that possible? Father, replied Ellen, I told you yesterday of the gentleman who asked me in Oxford Street why I was so sad, and who bought me all my flowers when I told him of your illness. Today he came back, and inquired so kindly about you, and then said that I would take the wine with me for reinforcement. Then he gave me this bottle, and asked if we have a doctor. When I told him that three doctors, despite all our pleading, had already refused to come, he became very angry. He asked for our address and promised to visit you today and send a good doctor. Oh, father, how happy I am, now you will certainly be well again. The father shook his head gently. Child, I pray you, be careful. What do you know about that stranger? Believe me, the rich don't just care about our poor. When they give something, they also want something in return. Therefore, be careful. My dear father, whispered Ellen, when you see the stranger, you will trust him. Well, I hope it will be so, my child. I know you, and I know that you will also find the right way alone. God save you, because I won't be able to do it any time soon. Dear father, don't speak like that. You break my heart with such words. Meanwhile Ellen had opened the bottle and half filled a glass of water. With great care she let her father drink a few gulps. Thank you very much, my darling. Now I will also be strong enough to confide in you the secret, and take my guilt off you. Dear father, a debt to me. Thou, the best and noblest of all men? Come, Ellen, sit down at my bedside, and listen carefully to me. The sick breath was irregular and heavy, and fits of coughing interrupted his speech, so that Ellen could hardly follow her father's story, which he began slowly. On a June day in the year 1875, a young man, a former German officer, left Europe in a steamboat to begin another life in the New World. Foolishness had brought him to the point where he had to take off the king's robe. In addition, the playing devil had brought him into debts from an early age, which increased so much through usury that he lost his head. According to the common notion of honor in his circles, the young man should have put a bullet in his head, but he was too sensible for that. He went to a stranger, determined to obtain by his own strength the means to pay off his debts. My child, that young man was me, your father, Werner von Eichstadt, not George Warner, as you thought until now. In breathless suspense, Ellen listened to these confessions of her father, and gave him another draught of wine for reinforcement. After a short pause, the old man started again. On the ship I met a young man. He too went to the stranger. We were both the same age, and as he seemed a cheerful, good-natured fellow, who also had the same aim, I joined him. I will not describe to you the suffering and hardships I endured in the early years on the other side of the ocean. Enough, fate held me together with my traveling companion, though he was a base nature, and of savage passion. He called himself John Brown, although I later found out that his name was different. A coughing fit interrupted the patient. Breathing heavily, he fell back on his bed, and whispered, I'll have to cut myself short, for soon, I feel it, soon. Weeping, Ellen kissed her father's mouth. Mr. Warner, or rather Werner von Eichstadt, went on to say. John Brown, so I shall call him, persuaded me to return to Europe with him. He first brought me to Amsterdam, in his parental home. His father, a diamond cutter, had died in grief for his failed son. His bereaved mother, weeping with happiness, fell upon the prodigal son's neck, thinking that he had come back a better man. She would soon find out that this was not the case. John had often told me of a sister along the way, whom he portrayed to me as spiteful and malicious. An inexplicable hatred was always expressed in his words when he talked about her. 
so I was very surprised to meet a mature beauty in the young girl, barely 17 years old. I stayed at home for a few weeks, and that was enough that both of us, that girl and I, learned to love each other sincerely. We asked her mother for her blessing. The old woman started violently, and bade me follow her into another room. There I learned from her mouth the following romantic story. My bride's father, who had owned a very large diamond cutting factory, had trade relations with India years ago. One day a friendly captain visited him, whose merchant ship had just entered the harbour. In his company was a tall, remarkably handsome man, of a strikingly exotic type. The captain of the ship told that his companion was a prince of the tribe of the Yemenists. In one of the wars of that time with the Turks, his tribe had been dispersed and deprived of all its goods. In his flight from the enemy, his wife was also killed. Only his only child, a little daughter of a few months old, had he been able to save from the wrath of the enemies. After many dangers he had succeeded in striking the captain with whom he had maintained trade and friendship for many years. The captain volunteered to take the prince and his daughter to Europe and take care of them both. He now begged the diamond cutter and his wife to take the child with them to raise it. Both said they were willing to do so. Then the prince withdrew a ring from his finger and placed it in the sleeping child's hand. It was a broad gold ring, inscribed with strange letters, a round shield showing the head of an Indian wearing a turban-like headgear. The prince, through the captain, declared that by this gift he was lavishly concerned for the future of the child and her foster parents, for that the ring was the key to a secret. He gave an indication of the place where there was an immeasurable treasure of precious stones and gold which the prince had hidden before his flight. Asked for further information, he was just about to continue speaking when he suddenly collapsed. A heart failure had ended his life, and he took the secret with him to the grave. The child stayed with us, and we enjoyed it very much, the old woman continued with her tale. As we were always doing well, we never inquired into the secret of the ring. My husband and I agreed, however, that Mary, as we baptized the child, should learn the secret of her ring at her wedding. Now you can decide for yourself. Mary was then called into the room, and, with her mother's blessing on our union, was also given the ring as a memorial to her father. She thought only of the diamond cutter, for the secret of her birth had not yet been revealed to her, at my wish. Now this Mary, whom I had until then taken for John Brown's sister, was your good mother, in the sunny days of our young happiness we did not think of the secret of the ring. But there was someone else who was not at peace with that, that was John. He had overheard the conversation between his mother and me, and in his greed knew no other purpose than to secure the possession of the jewel, and to find out the secret. Mary wore her father's memento, the ring, on a black cord about her neck. In every possible way John tried to get hold of the ornament. Even after our marriage he was constantly on our tails, and often visited us in our little house, which I had bought in Mowden. The sick man was silent for a while, he was breathing heavily. After a few moments he continued, in a shaky voice. Now I come to the most difficult hour of my life, one evening I unexpectedly returned from a business trip, and found John, whom I thought to be in Amsterdam, trying to sneak into our bedroom. Senseless with anger, I grabbed a knife and struck John blindly. A terrible cry and he fell to the ground. Hastening to the alarm, your mother came into the room. When she saw the wounded man, she threw herself over him, and cried, Werner, what have you done? The concern which these words expressed, which, however, welled up in her good heart, seemed to me to be proof enough of her infidelity. In my blind jealousy I chased her out at night and at night. I cared no more about John, who lay bleeding and groaning on the ground. I lifted you out of your bed, took the unfortunate ring that was to blame for everything, and hurried off to the railway. Now away, away from here. That was my only thought. I sailed with you to London that very night. I had the house in Mowden sold by a notary. Thus I learned that John had been found with a wound that went right through his cheek. He had, however, refused any information as to how he had received the injury. I tried, now for the third time, to find a new life in London. Unfortunately, whatever I took, nothing was going to work out. I was expelled from every position. Fires robbed me of my hard-earned small possessions. Charges were calculated to make me lose my honest name. When the charges turned out to be unfounded, too, they had always cost me my position. In such a way life became hell for me. I am sure that John was the secret motive of all these persecutions, he alone is to blame for all the misfortune. Ever since I drew him with a knife that night, 
He clung to me and sought to destroy me. A look at our surroundings shows how well he succeeded. Richard and poor I now die and must leave you, my darling, without protection. Only one thing I have saved, see here. With his last strength the dying man straightened up, and with a trembling hand grasped the straw bag, from which he took out a package. After he removed the casing, a glittering object appeared. That is my legacy. You now know that your poor mother may still be alive. She did not die in Holland, as I told you. When I came to my senses after my departure, and as I thought your mother's innocence became ever clearer to me, I did everything I could to discover her whereabouts, but her track was and remained lost. Until the last moment I hoped that I would find my Mary, and beg her forgiveness. That hope was not fulfilled, but my desire remained unsatisfied. Therefore I pray thee, my child, now in my dying hour, seek thy mother and obtain her forgiveness for me. This ring will be the sign by which the mother recognizes her child, therefore always wear it. With a trembling hand the father put the ring on the index finger of his daughter's right hand. Breaking into tears, Ellen threw herself over him and kissed his forehead. The hand of the dying man rested on her head in blessing. The breath went choking and coughing, and it seemed as if he sought to encompass her whole figure with his last glance. Listen, my child. The secret of this ring good luck found me. I now know that you will be rich, and I therefore pray you again, seek your mother. Money opens all doors, and it will bring you to it. As I let my whole life pass before my mind today, I contemplated this ring too. My right hand slipped over the Indian's head, and suddenly, a tremor ran through the body of the dying man, with a sigh he sank back onto the bed, and his eyes closed forever. He took the secret of the ring with him for eternity. Ellen wept loudly. If she had never seen a dead person before, she felt that a faithful father's heart had ceased to beat here. The excitement of the last half hour had been too strong for Ellen, a beneficent impotence came over her. Suddenly the door opened and the ghostly guest, chased away by Ellen's entrance, entered. A devilish laugh folded his face. Blood red was the scar on John's face, for it was he who entered. With one leap he was at the bed of the dead, a quick grasp of Ellen's right hand, and with brutal force he tore the ring from the finger of the unconscious. Finally found it. Now thou art mine, and with thee thy treasure. He quickly put the ring, which was too small for his finger, in his pocket, not noticing that a glittering object had slipped from him as he snatched the ring from Ellen's finger. Then with an evil laugh he left this abode of death. The candle had burned out when Ellen awoke from her impotence. She stroked the black locks, as if they first gather most of her thoughts. Then, however, when she saw her father's corpse, a new stream of tears broke out. Slowly she rose and approached the window. Now the memory of what had been heard returned to her senses. In her desolation, the thought of her mother rose in her soul like a sweet consolation. She looked at her hand to examine the ring, the memento. He was gone. She thought for a moment. Surely she remembered that her father himself had put the ring on her finger, where could he be now? She looked anxiously into space, and the suspicion of loss clenched her chest. She searched diligently in every nook and cranny. It became increasingly clear to her that the ring had disappeared. Now I shall never find him again. In nameless sorrow these words came from her lips. At this moment there was a knock at the door. Ellen opened the door, and a well-built, elegant, middle-aged gentleman entered. He wore a small moustache, and had a good pair of eyes. Well, miss, there I am, as I promised, were the first words of the intruder. The doctor will come very soon. I have only gone on, knowing that you were very anxious about your father, and that I wanted to give you the good news quickly. I hope the patient is feeling a little better. With her left hand Ellen covered her eyes to keep the stream of tears from, with the judge she pointed to the deathbed. Slowly the stranger approached, one look told him enough. He laid his hand softly on her head, and said. Dear, miss, your sorrow is very understandable, for it is humane to mourn for those who are taken from us. Remember, however, that he is now delivered from great suffering, and from many hardships. Grant him peace. You can be carefree for the future. I myself, of course, take care of the funeral and of all necessary arrangements. And if sometimes I can help you with anything, just tell me, it will be done. How shall I thank you, finally sobbed Ellen, that you take so care of the forsaken. Here is my address, said the stranger, laying his card on the table. If you have any wish, write to me, or send me a message, 
I will then be at your service shortly. For the most urgent, I beg you to take this trifle from me. With these words, the stranger took two five-pound banknotes from his wallet and placed them on the table. No, sir, Ellen glanced briefly at the card, which read John Babbitton in graceful letters, I can't take it. I beg you again. Consider it borrowed money, and return it to me later. Mr. Babbitton offered Ellen's hand. She seized it and bent as if to kiss it, but he quickly withdrew his hand from her. Is there anything I can do for you at this moment, dear miss? Yes, sir, I urge you for advice and help. I am more unhappy than you can imagine. An hour ago I heard from my mother, whom I thought dead, that she was still alive. And at the same time, in the same hour, I lost her with my father. I don't understand you well, please tell me what you mean. Interrupted by convulsive sobbing, Ellen told her everything that her father had entrusted to her. Babbitt and Ellen's story followed with new more mounting amazement. When she had finished, he took out an electric flashlight, and said. Now, Miss Ellen, we'll look to see if the ring can't be found. Together, step by step, they began to search the floor. Suddenly Babbitton stooped and lifted a shiny object that lay close to a table leg. What is that now? Have you found the ring? Ellen asked, and joyful hope came out of her tone. No, not the ring, replied Babbitton, but something else, but I can hardly believe it belongs to you. With these words he placed a cufflink on the table and let the light of the flashlight fall on it. A sea of light seemed to emanate from the knot. It looked like a pyramid of brilliance, around which coiled a serpent composed of the most beautiful sapphires. Two brilliant rubies were to represent the reptile's eyes. This knot represents a small fortune, exclaimed Babbitton. Then how does it get here? I don't understand. Never have I seen anything so beautiful, replied Ellen with the greatest admiration. A triumphant smile passed over the face of our human friend. Now I think I understand what happened. Will you permit me, Miss Ellen, to keep this knot for the time being? He will do us good service. I believe I can now definitely assure you that you will soon have your ring back. Here, in the face of thy dead father, I swear to thee that I will avenge his suffering upon the villains who caused it. I consider it my life's task to be a helper of the poor and afflicted, and to punish the ruffians who fatten themselves with the blood and sweat of the poor. Do you trust me? Mr. Babbitton, you are so good. I place my fate entirely in your hand. Very well, dear Miss Ellen, and you will not regret it. Now come with me, I'll take you to a good hotel, then you won't have to be with the dead one tonight. Thank you very much, but I'm not afraid. Here is my place. Chapter 2 In the Trap We are in a bachelorette room on Fleet Street. It is ten o'clock in the morning, of a clear autumn day, and the sun's rays reflect in the room on all kinds of weapons and tools on display. Heavy Indian carpets, leopards, and tiger skins cover the floor. Rifles of rare form, pistols and knives, the hilts of which are inlaid with precious gems, hang on the wall. Scattered everywhere are idols, vases and all kinds of strange things. One would almost imagine being in a museum if not one object disturbed the artistic viewer, against one of the walls of the room is a large iron safe. In front of an elegant writing table, on the opposite side of the room, sits a man. He wears an Indian sleeping skirt, richly decorated with gold, and a grey undergarment of the last taste. He just jerks up and throws away a letter in anger which he had read with great attentiveness until this moment. Now for the first time, his face is easy to record. A pair of small, glittering eyes in a pale yellow face give the initially elegant, sturdy appearance something repulsive. A broad scar, from the right temple to the corner of his mouth, makes us instantly recognize him as the man who had snuck into the dying man's room to steal the mysterious ring. Does that rascal really believe that I will let him take me out? He hissed, full of hatred. At this moment a strange noise was heard. John Brown, as we shall keep calling him, rushed to a decorative one beside the safe. He pushed back an Indian carpet, which served as a base for several weapons, and pressed a spring. As if touched by an invisible hand, the decorative moved soundlessly back half a meter, only the weapons tapped softly against each other. A rare figure emerged through the narrow opening created in this way. On a dwarf little body, further marred by a large hump, sat a disproportionately ridiculously large head, with a spiky, crimson head of hair. With a grin, the incoming John Brown nodded, then shut the secret door with a quick jerk. 
It was clear from the manner in which he did this that he had not come this mysterious way for the first time. Good morning, John. You called for me, friend, and here I am. With these words the dwarf offered John his mangled hand, which was missing the index finger. With some hesitation our host pressed the hand of the red one. A mocking smile crossed his gin face. Don't be afraid. You know that hand, right? It owes it to your kindness that it is not quite complete today. But what's the matter, my boy? There must be something special that your lordship is so quickly summoning me here. Sitting comfortably on an ottoman, the hunchback pulled out a pipe, lit it, and looked at John, curious what was to come. He took the penultimate issue of the Times from his desk, pulled up a chair, and asked the hunchback. Didn't your attention fall on a rare advertisement for a nice find yesterday, Jim? This one pulled his face back into a grin as he replied. You know that found objects only interest me if I've found them myself, and I don't advertise them. Jimmy gave this, in his opinion a very witty answer, with a grunting laugh. His companion paid no heed, but in a sonorous, melodious voice read the following announcement, found IT a precious cufflink last night. The owner is requested to send an accurate description thereof to the address below. If that description is correct, the owner will immediately return what has been found. As the finder desires no reward. XC10 Post Office 3. When John had finished, he looked expectantly at the hunchback. This one pretended not to notice, he devoted all his attention to cleaning his pipe. Now, Jim, what do you say to that? From what? Well, from this ad. What shall I say to that? That must be a terrible ass of a guy. That finds a precious knot, then soon advertises it to get rid of it again, and doesn't even want a reward. But did you summon me in such haste to do that, to read something from an old newspaper? No, Jim, but there's a very curious event associated with that ad, which makes me a little worried. I had a little business to do the day before last night. You know how I'm fond of old-fashioned ornaments. Now, in short, I had the opportunity to gain an old ring. The hunchback nodded gleefully at John, his eyes narrowed. It's a good thing, my boy, that you say get mighty. If you had said, I had the opportunity to buy the ring, I would have laughed in your face, for I know enough how you grow your valuables. Stop with that stupidity, said John angrily. We know what we can do with each other, and you can spare your witty remarks. All right, my boy, if you will, growled Jim and busied himself with his pipe again. So as I said, on my walk. Walk is good, Jim grinned. Stop the damned mocking at last, and rather listen, cried John now, furiously. All right, murmured Jim. That night I lost one of the cufflinks, which you also know. The pyramid of brilliance with the little serpent, the token of my dignity as Grand Master of our league. Poor boy, Jim chuckled wickedly. You know what Schiller said, and felt dear mantle, must dear Herzog Natch. Now it was a cufflink, but you can't know. You can keep your witty remarks to yourself, and rather give me advice and help. In what way, my boy? Shall I go find the knot? Then you must first tell me where you bought that famous ring, jeered the hunchback. Be sensible at last, and let me finish. I already have the button back. Well then, my dear, what more could you want? When I read the newspaper yesterday, I immediately noticed that advertisement. I did not doubt for a moment that it was my cufflink. So I immediately wrote a courteous letter, with a precise description, and bade the finder come to me. Instead, however, I will receive a letter of stated value by the first post this morning. I open it, and, to my great delight, find the lost cufflink. Ah, now I finally find out, interrupted the hunchback, now you send for me soon to celebrate this happy occasion with an old friend, over a nice bottle of wine. Ignoring this snap, John continued. Besides the carefully wrapped button, I found in the package a note, the contents of which have disturbed me for several reasons. John got up, went to the writing table, and picked up the letter which he had thrown away on entering the hunchback. Listen, John Brown Esquire. All the devils, came from the mouth of the hunchback, who sprang up as if bitten by a viper. Ignoring this, John continued, John Brown Esquire. From this inscription, which certainly brings back old memories, you will understand that I know who Mr. John Blake Horst, as you imagine yourself, used to be. I know more, however, 
I am sending your cufflink back to you today, but informing you that I will exchange the Indian ring for it as the finder's fee. I must do it myself, for it is hard to expect that you will send it to me. John C. Raffles. John lowered the hand in which he held the letter, and watched the impression its contents had made on Jim. He stood, hands in pockets, contemplating and chewing on his pipe. Raising his head slowly, that half-satanic, half-good-natured chuckle reappeared across his face. Well, my boy, I think that's bothering you. How did that gentleman get to know your former pseudonym? And who is that gentleman? Who? Snapped John, don't you know who Raffles is? Surely you have heard of the gentleman thief, who has recently fixed up the tremendous theft of the pearl necklace, and whose enigmatic burglaries keep all Scotland Yard in motion. The press even gloats that all efforts of the police to catch the thief have failed. A grunt of laughter made the hunchback hear. All devils, of course. I've laughed so much at him before, but the name had escaped me. That must be a famous guy, I would like to get to know him. Now, my good Jim, who knows, if you won't have an opportunity to do that very soon, if you're still so pleased with it, though. Now that gentleman announces his visit to me. I think the police are asking for her protection. My boy, I'd rather not do that in your place now, objected the hunchback. Whoever, like you, has a few dark pages in his book of life should not draw the attention of the police to himself. Who will make me what? I am known as a rich man, live on my annuities and collect antiquities. My former little affairs is nobody's business. But now to the point. Surely you are well acquainted with the iron box built into the wall at the altar in our so-called Cave of the Damned. I know that I can completely rely on you. Here is a note, which you call the word, that will open the letter lock of the chest. Now you take this little package, go to the secret entrance, which is known only to you besides Warbson, and put the package in the big chest. I'm sure that devilish bastard that Raffles keeps his word and will come back to rob me. The ring, however, will not fall into his hands though he move heaven and earth for it. With these words John Blakehorst, as we shall call him by his proper name, opened the safe, and took out a small package, which he handed Jim. He casually slipped the package into his right trouser pocket. Carefully, Blakehorst closed the safe and placed the key in a compartment of his writing table. When he turned he saw the hunchback still standing in the same place, picking a match in his pipe. What are you still here for? Go and do exactly as I have told you. Don't be so angry now, my boy, grinned the hunchback. You know that I am happy to be of service to you, and that you can rely on me. But if you have to walk very far, you'll be thirsty on the way, and the pocket money you've kindly given me is gone. Blakehorst frowned gloomily. I gave you five pounds only the day before yesterday, and now you have no money again? Yes, my boy, that's what happened last night in Hester Street. Can't you resist that cursed play? Blakehorst grumbled. If I couldn't rely on you so absolutely. And if, Jim interrupted, grinning, you didn't need my silence so much, it was different. With a half-smothered curse Blakehorst tossed the hunchback two guineas, twenty-five. How little, my boy. Get out of here. Now, now, my boy, don't be so nervous now. Raffles is not yet on the doorstep, sneered the hunchback, pressing the spring of the secret door. A few moments later he was gone, and the room was back to its usual appearance. There was a knock at the middle door. Blakehorst got up and opened the door. The friendly face of an old woman appeared. Well, what is it, Betsy? asked Blakehorst. His housekeeper held out to him a silver platter, on which lay a neat business card, and said, in a loud voice, to deaf people. Mr. Blakehorst, this gentleman wishes to speak to you. The card said, John Babbitton. Blakehorst could not remember ever having heard that name, and so said curtly. Let sir come in. The housekeeper withdrew, only to return shortly afterwards with the visitor, to whom she opened the door. In elegant visiting room, quite a gentleman, John Babbitton crossed the threshold. A friendly smile played on his lips as he bowed to Blakehorst and said. I must express my apologies for bothering you like that. However, where I think I can do you a service, I hope that my intrusions will be excused. I am at your service, said Blakehorst, a little coolly, as he pushed his guest into a chair. Leaving for a moment, Babbitton thanked him and sank into the armchair. With a single glance, without appearing immodest, yet he took in all his surroundings sharply. 
When the gentlemen had both taken their seats, Blake Horst, offering the contents of his cigarette case to his guest, asked. And how can I be of service to you? Babbitton took a cigarette, then made a defensive movement with his hand, and said. Let me tell you what brings me here. For some days I heard in my club of your precious collection of eastern weapons and antiquities. I myself am a great friend of such antiquities, and would like to see your collection. Since such a longing of a stranger may seem a little strange, you certainly permit me to express my gratitude beforehand for the kindness. With these words Babbitton took a package from his pocket. When he had loosened it, a small gold Indian idol emerged. Blakehorst was knowledgeable enough to notice at once the considerable value of this. He looked at the work of art with lustful eyes. Babbitton, watching him closely, and noticing this very well, Blakehorst handed over the idol with a triumphant smile. I am pleased to see that this little thing arouses your interest, and I beg you, therefore, to give it a place in your collection. But Mr. Babbitton, how can I accept such a precious gift from you, who are hitherto unknown to me? It means no loss to me, as you may believe, replied Babbitton, for I have a second copy. I shall rejoice, if on occasion you will do me the honor of your visit, to show you my collection as well. But with the greatest pleasure, perhaps I can show you some kind of gratitude. In any case, I gratefully accept this precious piece, and hope to take my revenge, said Blake Horst who had taken hold of greed. May I show you my collection now? With these words he wanted to get up. Babbitton, however, laid his hand on his arm and said. I beg you to hear me just a moment. Where we have the same hobby, I dare to afford one more weighty request. Speak freely, dear sir, I am entirely at your service. It is a very delicate matter which concerns me, began Babbitton. He spoke slowly and emphatically, apparently dividing his attention between his cigarette and his fingertips, but indeed studying Blakehorst's face keenly. In the club where I heard of your precious collection, I was also told by a good friend, whom I cannot name, that you two are closely related to a circle whose existence is denied by one, by the other. Others sustained. Blakehorst paled slightly. I really don't know what association you mean, I belong to several clubs. Well. Mr. Blakehorst, I want to state first that I have always been a great friend of secret societies, and that I am ready to make any monetary sacrifice requested. I own large diamond mines in India, and I have the opportunity to enrich your collection with many a precious piece. I very much request you, therefore, to indicate to me the means and the ways by which I may be admitted into the association of the Brothers of the Devil. I give you my word that I will not release any of your information to my friends. Blake Horst played nervously with his croppo's brush. On his face there was clearly a conflict inside him. After a short break, Blake Horst started. I really don't know what to do or say. You have come to me so kindly. And I will never forget your kindness, if you will grant my request. Blake Horst rose and walked with great strides about the room. Then he said. The day after tomorrow, Thursday, there is a meeting. I will speak to the drivers and introduce you. Do not believe, however, that you will experience much, for every newcomer has to pass many tests. I submit to all conditions. Good. You go by train to Stonebridge Park. Coming from the station, continue down the avenue to the right, about twelve hundred paces. Then you come to a small house. When you knock, an old woman will open the door, and she will ask what you want. Then you put the index finger of your right hand on your heart, and say, God damn. Then you will be let in. You walk through two rooms, and then knock three times on the right wall of the last room. Then you will notice the rest. Babbitton had risen and reached out to Blake Horst. I thank you very much. You will see that I will not forget your kindness and will reciprocate it. What time do I have to go to that cottage in Stonebridge Park on Thursday? About nine o'clock in the evening. Thank you very much. May I ask you now to show me your collection? Blakehorst showed some weapons and hilts, and related a few things. After a few minutes, however, Babbitton said. I do not see in your collection those gold and precious stones which are so beautifully made in India. Oh, surely, replied Blakehorst, laughing, there are some. He went to his writing table and took from the secret drawer the key to the large safe. The moment he turned in front of the safe, two strong arms seized him from behind and before he came to his senses he felt a lump in his mouth and a cloth was thrown over his face. 
a strange sweet air became noticeable in the room. Chloroform, gasped Blake Horst, and immediately the strong fellow sank. Triumphantly Babbitton looked at him. Well, my boy, now I know everything I wanted to know. So you can be found in Stonebridge Park. Finally I have the trail of that savage Maub, the brothers of the devils. Since you yourself were kind enough to give me the keys to the valuables, I will take the liberty of making extensive use of them. To begin with, we will take the idol again, you have seen it, my dear, and that was enough. With the key, which he took from Blake Horst, he effortlessly opened the door of the safe and took out all that could be found of valuables and cash. When the safe appeared empty, he frantically searched every corner. Where's the ring? He finally wondered despondently. I have promised my protégé to bring him back, and must keep my word. All searches in the safe having been futile, Babbitton went to take a look at the writing table. He searched every drawer, every corner. In vain. Among the papers, a letter he had found in the secret drawer drew his attention. He flew through it quickly. Great astonishment showed itself on his face. At last he put the letter into his pocket with a satisfied smile and said in a half-loud voice. My protégé, little Ellen can rejoice. If I can't bring her the ring today, I know where her mother is. There was a piece of paper on the writing table. Babbitton sat down, and wrote on it these words. Don Brown. If I haven't found the ring today either, I'll keep looking. I come back, and will find him, on my word of honor. John C. Raffles. Then he removed the gag from the still unconscious man put the stolen valuables in the pockets of his overcoat, and left the room as if nothing had happened. Chapter 3 In the Cave of the Damned When John Raffles left Blakehorst's house, he jumped into a cab, and gave the coachman his address in nearby Oxford Street, where he lived in chambers under the name of Mr. Babbitton. He was home in a few minutes. His friend Charlie, with whom he lived, was pacing impatiently in the drawing room. When he saw Raffles coming, he opened the door for him himself. Quick, Charlie, cried John Raffles, rushing in, my disguise, which I use for Hester Street. Hurry up, we must get out of here as soon as possible. The secretary quickly gathered what was needed, and Raffles quickly changed his clothes. Meanwhile he told his friend what had happened to him. At last, Charlie, I know where those scoundrels, those brothers of the devils, are hiding. Even if for the moment I have not achieved more than to know where the foxes have their den that is already quite a lot. We will continue to keep a close eye on the withers. In this expedition, however, I shall urgently need your faithful assistance. Now listen carefully. I must at least catch the first train to Stonebridge Park. If I can do that, I'll be a long way. For you can count on your fingers that, when Blakehorst comes to his senses and understands who has honored him with a visit, he will at once go to Stonebridge and tell the porter what is the matter. By no means, however, can he catch the first train and that puts me two hours ahead. That's enough. Meanwhile, you pack up all our stuff and send it to the station. Fix it up so that you have everything ready in two hours, and follow me in disguise with the next train. Then if you ever find Blake Horst, don't lose sight of him. You must in any case stay close to the cottage I have described to you, for I think I shall need your help. We'll have to see what happens next, but I'm sure I'll rely on you. You can replied Charlie. I'll get everything ready and be at Stonebridge Park on time. Then goodbye, my boy. With these words John Raffles went out, and no one had looked for in that thumb type the elegant gentleman who had driven up in a cab ten minutes ago. He sauntered along slowly to the corner of the street, as if time were no money to him, but all the while he kept a keen eye out for an empty carriage. One was just round the corner, and Raffles motioned for him to stop. The coachman was pleased with this little load which promised him little, but was moderately pleased. But when he pressed a five-shilling piece into his hand, he suddenly cleared up. As fast as you can drive to West End Station. If you're there in ten minutes, there's a good tip. With these words the great unknown disappeared into the carriage. The coachman took up the whip, and it was speeding toward West End Station. Just before the station Raffles jumped with great dexterity from the carriage still going at full speed, threw two shillings to the coachman who could not restrain his horses so quickly, and disappeared into the station. Quick as the wind he bought himself a rail ticket, stormed up the station stairs, and arrived just in time to jump into an empty compartment. The locomotive whistled, and slowly the train started moving.
Just got it, he gasped breathlessly and sat down comfortably in a corner. At Crooklewood another old woman entered the compartment, but got out again at Will's den, leaving Raffles alone for the last leg. Shortly before the train's arrival at Stonebridge Park, he once again convinced himself whether he had brought his browning revolver, the vial of chloroform, and the electric flashlight. Since everything was in order, he muttered contentedly. All right, the game can begin, let's hope it will be a comedy. Arriving on the spot, he at once walked into the avenue, marked out by Blakehorst, and carefully counted his footsteps. In his understandable excitement he had certainly taken two long strides, for within ten minutes he had reached a small house, which was well painted. Friendly it lay there with a small veranda and a nice garden. There was nothing remarkable about it, quiet and peaceful it lay and no sound disturbed the silence. Would I have gone wrong? muttered Raffles. Blakehorst said twelve hundred paces. I've only travelled a thousand, but the nearest house is at least as far from here as this is from the station. So we'll give it a try. Quickly decided, the great unknown passed through the gate and ran swiftly through the small front yard. There was nothing in the front door that resembled a knocker or a bell, and so Raffles struck the door with a key which he took from his pocket. Shuffling footsteps approached slowly. An advanced woman opened a small, almost invisible flap in the door. She looked suspiciously at the stranger, and asked what he wished. Raffles placed the index finger of his right hand on his heart, and pronounced the password Blakehorst had told him, God damn. Without saying a stupid word, the old man closed the flap and opened the door. It was a woman, about the mid-fifties. The face betrayed the lover of the drink, and made a repulsive, impudent impression, which heightened her small, false eyes. The old man, after she had closed the door, no longer cared at all about the person who had come in. She settled back into her armchair, and immersed herself in the reading of a robbery novel, from time to time appealing to the gin bottle that stood beside her. Following the directions given to him, Raffles walked through the two small rooms to the right. Their arrangement betrayed by no means what particular purpose they actually served. Everything made a wealthy and sober, in fact, petty bourgeois impression. White curtains in front of the windows, and some flowering plants in front of them. A regular ticking clock on the chimney created a very homely mood. When Raffles had entered the rear room, which was little different from the others, he found himself placed in front of the mysterious wall. Shaking his head, he looked at it. No matter how hard he strained his eyes, which were accustomed to searching, he could see nothing special in this simple grey-green wallpaper. Two old paintings, apparently family portraits, in oval gilt frames, hung on the wall. One portrait represented a gentleman dressed in a black skirt, after the model of the middle of the last century. The other showed the bust of a woman, of which only the bright red throat band stood out. After Raffles have convinced himself that he was alone, he gently felt the wallpaper with his hands, however, he found nothing special. Disgruntled, he stepped back a few steps, and then subjected the wall to another keen examination. As this also had no effect, he took his revolver in his right hand and struck three powerful blows against the wall with his left. All his nerves were in action. He waited a few minutes in the greatest suspense. But in vain, nothing moved. He was just about to repeat the knock when a few dull blows rang out at the outer door. He heard the old woman growling and grumbling to her feet and shuffled toward the door. Leaping like a cat, he ducked behind an armchair, which he had first positioned so that he could see from behind it to the front door. The old woman, meanwhile, had opened the door, and tumbled in, our friend the hunchback. Now Jim, grunted the woman, you're in a fine state again. The hunchback gave his familiar chuckle. My dear, don't taunt, rather give me a kiss. With these words Jim walked up to the old man, arms outstretched, and brought his gin face doubtfully close to hers. Don't come near me again, old boozer, growled the woman, and gave Jim a good nudge so that his feeble legs slid under him. Cursing, he fell to the ground. Come, come, don't be so rough all the time, said Jim, as he slowly got back up. The bitch stopped looking up at him as Jim sniffed up his pipe and then turned to the woman with a shy expression. Tell me, you mustn't tell the master that I, it was so hot, and the road is long you know how much, how much I love you. Jim put his mangled hand on his heart, and stood waving in front of the old woman. Leave me alone, and go to the devil, she cried angrily. I will, replied Jim, and made his way slowly, leaning on the furniture everywhere, toward the back room. 
Raffles had, of course, heard this with great interest. When he noticed that Jim was drunk he knew him from the Thugs pub in Hester Street, where he had seen him several times in his present disguise his plan was soon made. He stretched out in a chair, crossed his legs, and lit a cigarette. Holler, crippled dick, cried Jim, when he caught sight of Raffles. Then, suddenly for a moment sober, he asked timidly. Dick, did the boss send you here to check on me? He can rest assured. I have kept his ring well, and will just put it away. You can see for yourself. John Raffles watched for a blow to his ear. What did he mean by that ring? Would Jim be in possession of the Indian gem? And was Blake Horse then the boss? These and other thoughts flew through his brain at lightning speed. Meanwhile Jimmy had approached the window. He opened the right wing of the upright windows, and felt his mangled hand along the sills. Well damned. Now I see ain't find the button at all. Don't sit there so sluggishly, and lend me a hand rather, grumbled Jim to Raffles. I think, said Raffles, you're so drunk you don't even know what to do with the knob. Here such a green. I know everything. Well, my friend, let's hear it then. One turns the knob to the right, and then presses the screw down, clapped Jim. Wonderful, bravo. Now I see you're not as drunk as I thought, laughed Raffles, and patted the hunchback on the shoulder familiarly. See. And now don't tell Blakehorse that I've had one too many drinks. I have come across Red Juning. He had done well, and wanted to play a game, that made it a bit late. Raffles was getting a little restless in the meantime. Time passed, and he still had achieved nothing. So he said to Jim. It is getting late, and you must put the ring away. You are right, dear friend. Be so kind, my boy, and open it up. The drunk man pointed his hand at the window. Raffles followed the directions the hunchback had just given him. No sooner had he pushed the screw down than the intricate mechanism set in motion, and the whole wall sank into the abyss. Raffles noticed it with surprise, but of course he made a face, as if he had seen it a hundred times. Well, come with me, my boy, grinned the hunchback, and stepped through the opening into a small room, which looked quite ordinary. The great unknown followed him. Shall we not put things in order first, asked Raffles, whose main concern was to get to know the mechanism exactly, for he had some inkling that he would not be here for the last time today. If you're such a law-abiding person, do it yourself. Yes, dear Jim, but you know I'm not as strong as you. Flattered, the hunchback chuckled. In his unctuous voice he said. Yes, yes, you have no more marrow in your bones. Come on. You press the button here on the right, and I'll hold the spring in the meantime. Scarcely had they done it, when without a sound the wall rose from the depths, and closed the opening again. Now Raffles knew enough. He now also understood why the wall was not hung on either side, and why he had not found a spring or knob anywhere. Well, my boy grinned Jim, now I've helped you, but now you must help me push that damned cupboard aside. With these words he pointed to a heavy cupboard standing in the opposite corner. When the cupboard was moved, Raffles saw with amazement a trapdoor in the floor. The hump stooped to open it, but that didn't go well. His hydrocephalus seemed too heavy and with a suppressed curse he fell sprawled to the ground. Raffles helped the drunken swine back up, and now opened the trapdoor himself. Cursing and furiously, the hunchback descended a flight of stairs, which showed itself to Raffles' curious look. He followed closely behind the dwarf. Suddenly an electric lamp went on, and lit up the stairs as brightly as if it were daytime. Jim had turned the light on. Down the stairs they came to a heavy door lined with mattresses on both sides, and when Jim opened it, they entered a subterranean passage. At the end of it, after walking about 150 yards, they came upon another door, lined with the first on both sides. Jim turned a knob in the middle, and the entrance opened. Both were now in a room, measuring five by about four and a half meters. The ceiling was painted, and a crown hung from it. In the middle of the room was a black coffin. Attracted by a light, Raffles turned his head curiously. Opposite the entrance, which had closed itself silently, a transparency had been placed. And beneath it, Raffles stiffened in horror, was a row of glasses of terrible contents. The great unknown had strong nerves, but what he saw here was too strong for him. Inside each of the spirit-filled glasses was a human index finger. Warning, these seemed to call to the viewer. Be careful. Bewildered, Raffles looked on, 
and he could not avert his gaze from those glasses with their hideous contents. There came the growling voice of the drunken hunchback behind him. Well, my boy, are you looking for my finger? There at the top, sixth from the right, that's him. Raffles involuntarily looked at the hunchback's right hand. He stretched out his hand and grinned. Would you believe that beautiful finger had once sat there? But leave him where he is, he'll be fine. He's in spirits all day and the rest of the guy has to get his position through a glass of brandy. Raffles turned his back on the gossip in disgust. This one, in his drunkenness, seemed to misinterpret the movement. At least he slapped Raffles on the shoulder, and said. Now you don't have to be so big, my boy, because you still have your finger? Who's to say how long that will take? I'm telling you, it's going damn fast, and our boss isn't kidding. If you drink a glass too much, and you can't keep your mouth shut, you'll lose your finger in no time. I tell you, it was a bad story when they dragged me in here gagged. The hunchback pointed to a second door. The board was festively gathered, and would decide what punishment I had deserved, and which of the three organs which I, like everyone who had joined, had sworn to belong to him, the index finger, the tongue, or the heart, I should give up. I can tell you, my boy, that I was not well, my heart was beating, as if it wanted to jump out of my body, and my tongue went to and fro, as if she had stopped talking forever. As it was concluded that I had only spoken of our edifice under a good drink, but that I had not mentioned any of our assembly places or comrades, the master contented himself this time with a finger. I'm telling you, it's just a great remedy. You are constantly reminded of what you have done, even the sign of the covenant I can only make with the stump of my finger. Raffles had heard these digressions in silence. Cursing, the dwarf now began to examine his pockets. Where have I now that cursed ring? The boss wrote me down the key word for the secret lock anyway. I can't find the thing. Thus tauntingly the hunchback approached the door in the background, which he slammed open with his foot. The great unknown who had followed him saw before him an infernal dark depth. The hunchback pressed a button and immediately an electric light shone. It was an extraordinarily large room, with eight large niches. Three crowns illuminated it, and cast their light on an outbuilding which looked like an altar and in front of which a painting depicting the devil, holding a wonderfully beautiful woman in his arm, while he exclaims to her with his right hand. The body tears. Behind the altar, on a dais, stood a seat, along the arms of which grass snakes writhed, their wide, hideous moors turned toward the viewer. In the eight niches were low, oriental couches, which in their alluring plumpness formed a curious contrast with the gruesome surroundings. In the background of the room stood a large chopping block. An axe, a sharpened dagger and a pair of pliers, which served to pluck out the wrong tongues, lay crossed over it. While Raffles took in, Jim tried to open a heavy iron case that stood in the wall beside the altar. Dick, come here and help me, he cried at last to Raffles, I can't get that damned lock open. He handed him the note he had received from Blake Horst, which contained the secret word for the lock. Right Hannah, left Fakir, read Raffles. He quickly set the lock and the cupboard opened without difficulty. There, Dick, hummed Jim, put the ring in there, and then close the cupboard, my pipe has gone out again. And lying easily on one of the couches in one of the alcoves, Jim turned his attention to his pipe, which again, to his chagrin, would not draw. Thus Raffles found an opportunity to unobservedly remove the ring from the case. One glance convinced him that the ring belonged to Ellen's father. His eyes shone with triumph, his main goal, he had achieved. He slipped the ring into his pocket. Quickly he grabbed a notebook, pulled out a sheet on which he had written some words, and put it in the cupboard. He would have liked to have looked at the rest of the contents, but Jim, having repaired his pipe, got up and waved at him. Well, my boy, you won't be ready any time soon. I wanted to get out of here. My throat is dry, and you can't even get brandy in this cursed hole. Everything just finished, Jim, said Raffles, slamming the cupboard lid shut. The intoxicated person did not notice that the cupboard was not closed. The great unknown had carefully not adjusted the lock, hoping to inspect the rest of the cupboard unnoticed. Go on, go on, my boy, insisted Jim. The tongue sticks to my palate. Raffles, seeing no way of getting to the secret treasure now unnoticed, turned toward the door through which both had entered. Hello, boy, not from there. I know a shortcut. Chuckling, Jim beckoned Raffles. 
Since you've helped me so beautifully today, I'll tell you something I've only just discovered myself. Here behind that chair is a small door leading to a small staircase. We come out of there directly into a thicket, and are only five minutes from Peter Pat's Inn. It has fine brandy. Come on, I'll keep you free today, cause I like you, boy. Meanwhile both had gone to the chair with the serpent's heads. When the door was opened, a small staircase became visible, which was closed by an iron trap door. You've got to help a lot here, said Jim. There are sods on the door, and we have to throw them off. Raffles put his strong shoulders under the door and lifted it up without great difficulty. No sooner had Jim and Raffles crawled out of the dark prison than they discovered in the avenue of Wells de Green, which ran close by, a motor car approaching at breakneck speed. Damn, cried the hunchback, and plunged to the ground, there's Blake Horst. I know that green chariot exactly. Quick, quick, Dick, we must go down again, lest the boss notice that we know the secret exit. With a swiftness which would not have been attributed to the hunchback in his inebriated state, he had disappeared again into the abyss. Raffles stood still, handcuffed. He followed with his eyes the rapidly approaching automobile. His keen eye had noticed that someone had fastened behind the motor car. It flashed into his mind like lightning, that's Charlie. He watched with apprehension, it was thus on its way to destruction. A cry of terror escaped his lips. The figure suddenly disengaged from the automobile and disappeared into the dense clouds of dust. Raffles had involuntarily rushed forward a few steps, as if to help the fallen man. As a result, he now stood on an open grassy plain. He saw the fallen man get up and walk quickly towards Raffles, whom he had noticed. It was Charlie approaching his friend. I've seen everything, Raffles called to him. Wait here for me. But eyes and ears open. With these words he disappeared into the depths, and a few moments later found himself again with Jim. All of this that we are telling here had happened in a flash. Shut the door quickly, cried Jim. Raffles said it had happened, but he had left open both the trap door and the door behind the chair. He stood between the altar and the chair, somewhat in the shade, so that Blake Horst, who was just rushing into the main entrance, did not notice him. Foaming with rage, it flew toward the hunchback. Where's the ring? Has a stranger been here? Without waiting for an answer, he flew towards the cupboard. Pulling it open, he grabbed the case with trembling hands. A cry of anger came from his lips, it was empty. In a hoarse voice with emotion, he read aloud the note he had found in the case. John Brown. I have the ring and the treasure. John C. Raffles. Half mad with rage, Blake Horst threw himself on the hunchback. Dog. Damned. I owe that to you. Here, that's for you. He seized the sharpened dagger that lay on the block, threw himself upon the hunchback, and thrust the steel into his chest. With a gurgling sound, Jim sank to the ground. Turning around, the murderer suddenly became aware of the figure of the great unknown, who had watched impassively at what had transpired before his eyes at lightning speed. With an animal howl Blake Horst wanted to pounce on Raffles, the dagger glittered in his hand. Back. Raffles thundered at him, the revolver in his left hand. Blake Horst ignored the warning, but rushed on. A well-aimed boxing punch rendered him harmless. For your kind, the bullet is a sin. With these words and an unspeakably contemptible look, Raffles turned his back on the cave of the accursed. Arriving at the secret door, he turned once more and cried out in warning. Do not believe that your punishment is given to you. For today I have better things to do but I'll be back to deal with you human hyena once and for all. Then he went quickly to the exit. He found Charlie waiting for him. Come on, Charlie, where's the car? There he waits beyond that bend. Both walked there. Cautiously creeping on, Raffles suddenly threw himself on the driver's seat, and struck him to the temple. Charlie caught the unconscious, and together they laid the man in the grass, and stripped him of his coat. As they took the goggles from him, Raffles escaped an exclamation of surprise. Well, well, his good friend Warbson. You and Blake Horst are worthy of each other, and will not escape your punishment. Quickly the great unknown had put on Warbson's clothes, and no one recognized in the driver the wretched bum who had entered the house at the front. Raffles and Charlie mounted the car, and it went on, out of the lane into London. When they looked back, they saw Blake Horst appear, who had certainly recovered from his swoon. His face contorted with anger and his fists clenched, he stared after the fleeing. 
Charlie let out a gleeful tough tough, and Raffles kindly waved a farewell salute to his defeated foe. With these words, Ellen entered her father's deathbed. Then I wish you good night. The door slammed shut behind Babbitton. Sobbing, the girl sank by her father's corpse. Chapter 4 Raffles Keeps His Word As John Raffles and his friend drew nearer and nearer to the English metropolis, the former recounted what he had thus discovered. With horror, Charlie heard the tale of the secrets which the launch of the accursed hid. And you will let those ruffians continue their shameful business with impunity? Certainly not, Charlie, but first of all we have better things to do, for unfortunate Ellen longs for her mother. It will also be good to wait until those ruffians first feel a little safe again, then I will try to attend a secret session, to first acquaint myself well with the full extent of their crimes. But now, in the first place, the secret of the ring must be found out, and above all, Ellen must be returned to her mother. How are you going to handle that, John? We don't even know if she's alive, let alone where to find her. My dear Charlie, I know both. Surprised, Charlie looked at him and asked. Are you omniscient then? No, my dear, but I'm looking good, and I'm counting on my good luck a little too. And I must say that Fortuna has already been very kind to me today. John Raffles took from his wallet the note he had taken that morning from the secret drawer of Blakehorst's desk and handed it to Charlie. When the latter had read the letter, he handed it back and said, What a bastard that Blakehorst is! How touchingly the mother begs to share something of her child, if he knows anything about it. That Blakehorst had long known where to look for Ellen is quite clear, but I believe he would have led this woman astray rather than help her. I am convinced, Charlie replied Raffles, that he has not answered at all. Well, at any rate, we must give the mother back the child, and both the ring. Let us therefore ride as quickly as possible to the mother, whose address is fortunately in the letter. Barking Road is near Victoria Docks, isn't it? Charlie asked. Sure, go ahead. No, wait a moment. You can steer the car now, then I'll take a closer look at the ring in the car. The cook will fetch me, if I should not find the secret. Charlie took Raffles's place, and the latter sat down in the wagon. There he took the mysterious ring from the pocket, and looked at it from all sides. There was nothing special about it. The peculiar stone, into which the head of an Indian was carved, did not appear too thick, for some contours of the artifact were translucent, the reverse of the stone was also fully visible. The gold in which he was encased seemed to be solid. Raffles was about to slip the ring back into his pocket when his inquisitive glance at the gold plate, which jutted out a little under the head, thought it had made a small indentation. Gave the impression of an innkeeping. If that's a pin, it must be pullable, muttered Raffles, and took some very small tools from a waistcoat pocket case. But it wasn't as easy as he had imagined it to be. Only after much effort did he manage to grab the pin and pull it out. At the same moment something fell into his hand, it was a round plate. He turned the ring over and noticed that a small plate had come loose on the underside of the stone. It was cut as thin as a sheet of paper, and so fastened to the underside of the stone. As soon as the pin was pulled out, a very small spring came out. Because of this extraordinarily artistic work a small space had been created. Inside was a piece of thin parchment covered with infinitesimal marks and letters. John Raffles took out his loop and tried to decipher the signs. With great difficulty he read. 70.5 degrees, 12.25 degrees, Mangala, 13.1. Mangala, wondered Raffles. After all, that is a port on the west coast of the Indies. Suddenly a light came on him. That comes out. 70.5 degrees east longitude and 12.2 north latitude, that must be about an archipelago in the Arabian Sea, but let's see further. To decipher the faded marks with his loop. He found another small triangle, from which an arrow pointed to the left. A little further a point, created by the intersection of two lines. Thoughtful, Raffles stared straight ahead, putting the scrap of parchment in his wallet. Then he put the small plate back in its place, and slid the pin back. That was now much easier, and so after a few moments the ring looked just like it had before. Since the automobile is already in more populated parts of London, Raffles refused to change places to avoid a stir. He therefore leaned over to Charlie, and cried out to him. I found it. In the ring was a piece of parchment, and this points us, yes, where do you think? Now, 
probably to the place where the treasure of the Indian prince is to be found. Exactly. What do you think, shall we take a trip to India? At this moment Charlie steered the motor car into Oxford Street. Look, John, all those people in front of our house, he cried. You mean, for our former home, replied Raffles, be calm, my boy, we'll have a look in a minute. In our disguise, and with those goggles, no mortal recognizes us. A crowd had gathered in front of the house where Raffles and Charlie had hitherto lived, forcing the car to move slowly. Clearly Raffles and Charlie heard exclamations as, What do you say, the infamous Raffles lives here? They have him. Certainly, they have just brought him in gagged, what does he look like? A little woman asked curiously. He's red, and not half my size, replied a tall butcher's mate. How is it possible, said the woman, I had imagined him to be tall, slender, and black. At this moment the inspector of police Baxter appeared on the plane. Is the house surrounded? He asked the first best agent. This one stated yes. In the meantime the motor car had forced its way through the crowds in order to gain more space. Baxter noticed him, and said to Marholm, who had accompanied him. Isn't that Mr. Blakehorst's car? I know it by its striking green color. What a pity he doesn't stop. We could immediately confront him with that bastard, that Raffles, who broke into his house early this morning. Try to catch up with him soon. Inspector Baxter entered the house, while Marholm, with a sour sweet countenance, began to move to meet the burden that had been given to him. Despite his obesity, he began to run, shouting. Mr. Blakehorst. Mr. Blakehorst. Such an opportunity, of course, was not to be missed by the dear street youth, and so very soon everything roared. Mr. Blakehorst. Mr. Blakehorst. It seemed, however, as if he was dead. The more people shouted, the faster the car would run, and it was soon out of sight. Marholm gave up the pursuit, and returned coughing and hissing. Raffles and Charlie were, of course, delighted to hear the shouts of the crowd behind them, and continued on their way undisturbed. Charlie, Charlie, I'm afraid we're being tracked down today. In any case, we must prepare ourselves for a great journey, if the London soil is made a little too hot for us. Have you got all our stuff together at the main station? Everything all right. You know you can rely on my policy. By now the car had turned onto Barking Road and stopped in front of number 116. Mary Warner stood in large letters over the entrance of a small shop. While Raffles went inside in his driver's suit, Charlie remained behind the wheel. When the door was opened an electric bell rang. Raffles quickly took up the matter. It looked like a soap factory depot. All kinds of soaps and perfumes were on display. The door at the back of the shop opened to let in a middle-aged woman. She showed unmistakable traces of former beauty. The luxuriant black hair was now very grey, but still had a beautiful sheen. Big black eyes looked questioningly at the purchaser. The whole profile indicated unmistakably a kinship with Ellen. All this Raffles had seen with a glance, and he was quite free from doubt as to whether he was facing Ellen's mother. With what can I serve you, sir? She asked in a melodious voice. Mrs. Warner, Raffles began. I'm here on a private matter. I will say in advance that I do not wish to tell you anything unpleasant or sad, on the contrary, something that will bring you much joy. What will it be, sir, that thou proclaimest me a glad tidings my life hath known so few merry hours, that I scarce dare hope for joy any more? Raffles took the ring from his pocket and laid it silently before Mrs. Warner on the counter. With a light cry she reached for it. Sir. My name is Babbitton said Raffles, inclined. Mr. Babbitton, how did you get the ring? What do you know about my child? Is she alive? Bring me to her. Anxious, yet also trembling with joy, these words came from the lips of the bereaved woman. In her boundless emotion she had sunk into a chair. Raffles put his hand on her arm encouragingly. Don't worry now, dear madam. As I am not a master of my time today, I must beg you to go with me in my motor car at once, and within the quarter of an hour you will be able to hold your child in your arms. When Mrs. Wen Warner heard the words, she stood up trembling. Mr. Babbitton, she sobbed, you are a messenger from heaven to me. How shall I thank you for all that you do for me? By coming with me as soon as possible, mistress, for my time is very short. Supported by Raffles, she made her way to the car and moments later they were all on their way to the house in Whitechapel.
No our story. Ellen had just come home from an errand. She prepared her supper, tears streaming down her cheeks. The bed on the right side of the room was empty. The father had been carried to the place of eternal rest. Ellen felt so lonely and forsaken. The gift of her benefactor had made it possible for her father to be properly buried, and provided the rest with the necessities of the early days. But what would become of her then? She kept torturing herself how she could find her mother. She would have liked to talk about it with her friend and benefactor, but he hadn't shown himself for two days. He had promised to bring the ring and look for her mother. She had such firm confidence in his word that it had seemed unforgivable to her to inflame him more with her insistence. Seven blows rang out from the tower of the neighboring church. When the last sound had died down, Ellen awoke from her musings. In the meantime it had become quite dark, and she lit a small lamp. There was a knock on the outside door. Ellen opened and Raffles entered. Despite his car costume, she recognized him. Rejoicing and blushing she extended her hand to him and said. Oh, that's sweet, Mr. Babbitton, that you come, I have looked so much for you. The words had hardly escaped her, when she blushed and cast her eyes to the ground. John Raffles didn't seem to notice and said. My dear Miss Ellen, I promised to give you the ring again, here he is. With these words Raffles laid the jewel on the table before the eyes of the astonished. Don't ask me how I found him. Here he is, that should be enough for you now. Overwhelmed with gratitude, with tears in her eyes, Ellen extended her hand. Raffles held her hand and looked at her softly. My dear Ellen. For the first time he omitted the stiff miss, and his voice grew warm as he continued. My dear Ellie, I have something for you. I promised you to look for your mother and, be brave now, Ellen, for joy can kill too I'll bring her to you. Ellen stared blankly at Raffles. A slight tremor ran through her limbs, staring, she looked at Raffles. Raffles opened the door and there appeared, supported by Charlie, Mrs. Warner. Mother. My child. Both lay in each other's arms. Though they had been separated for years, the voice of the blood told her that they were one. Raffles and Charlie watched with deep emotion. At last the first approached the women, placing his hand gently on Ellen's shoulder. Be strong, Ellen. I have something else to tell you. Ellen and Mrs. Warner grabbed Raffles' hand. Ellen and Mrs. Warner, I have also discovered the secret of the ring. He told them both at length what we already know, and showed them the piece of parchment. Then he continued. I believe I may deduce from this that the treasure is in the Indies. It would be too troublesome for any of you to search for it. If you will trust me, I will do it, and bring you the treasure. You have returned my child to me, and ask if I trust you? Keep all the treasure, when you find it, it cannot be greater than that which you have brought me today. No, Mrs. Warner, I want to find the treasure for you and your daughter. In the meantime, that thou mayest be preserved from want, I beseech thee to take these thousand pounds sterling from me as an advance upon the treasure. John Raffles put a packet of banknotes in the mother's hand. Both women wanted to refuse, but he said firmly. I urge you to accept this, for it is only on that condition that I will search for the treasure. The women were about to shower him with thanks when there was a sudden knock at the outside door and, without waiting for the inside, police inspector Baxter entered. John Raffles quickly yanked the goggles from his eyes, and withdrew a little into the shadows. Good evening together. Good evening Mr. Blake Horst, Baxter said to Raffles. I just saw your motor car parked in front of the door. Since I failed to reach you once this evening, I allowed myself to come in here. I just wanted to inform you that we have not found that Raffles again. When we arrived at his house this afternoon, the bird had already flown. I know, said Raffles calmly. In the meantime he had imperceptibly approached the skylight and removed the pins, he gave Charlie a curt nod. He understood and followed Baxter to the window. Please, do you already know that? Baxter asked, stunned. Yes, for I am Raffles myself. With these words the great unknown tossed the goggles to the floor, and had leapt out of the window with a mighty leap, and leapt to the roof, where Charlie had followed him at lightning speed. Live well, my friends, I will bring you the treasure. Came a voice from outside, as if he had received a blow to the head, so dazed Baxter stood for a moment, then, cursing like a cat, he also jumped out the window and onto the roof. It was a steep, so-called Scottish roof, on which a wild hunt now began. Raffles and Charlie tried to climb the ridge first. 
resting one foot on two rectangular tiles, the great unknown took a strong swing. Thus he succeeded in getting hold of an iron hook placed about five feet above the skylight. Squatting like a cat, with the only support being this hook under its feet, it slid upwards at lightning speed. Charlie followed his trail faithfully. Baxter immediately tried to take the same one, beating his police whistle from time to time. He also managed to grab the hook. Just then, a piece of tile, which had collapsed under the weight of Charlie's foot, fell on Baxter's hand. Sharp as a knife, it cut deep into his skin. Paralyzed by pain, Baxter let go of the hook and, with a short scream, rolled down the sloped roof. To his luck, the gutter was strong enough to take a beating. The inspector clung to his feet and was on his feet the next moment. Then the persecution started again. Now following a different path, Baxter was soon back on track, but Raffles and Charlie had already gained a decent lead. But our inspector was a plucky gymnast, and so the distance between him and the pursued narrowed more and more. Suddenly Baxter heard a muffled rumor and the two pursued were gone. He made every effort to reach as quickly as possible the place where he had last seen them. There, escaping down a fire escape, he saw Raffles and Charlie in the shadows below. The moon provided free illumination. Without thinking twice, Baxter went after them. There he saw something dark fly through the sky at the end of a flat roof, which served for two houses next to each other. Baxter hurried forward. Now he was at the intersection of two streets. A gulf, seven to eight meters wide, grinned in front of him. Horrified, he stared into the depths. Where were the persecuted? After all, it seemed impossible that they should have taken that leap of faith. And scarcely did he trust his eyes, but he actually saw them appear for a moment on a house across the street, after which they disappeared into the shadows. Bursting with rage, Baxter took the return route, through the nearest skylight, to reach the street below. Chapter 5 Happy Escape Hiding in the shadows of the gable, Raffles and Charlie followed the inspector's movement. When they saw him disappear through the skylight, Charlie took a deep breath. We've outrun it again for now, John. But what now? We'll see. In the first place we have to go down into the station as soon as possible. Baxter will, of course, immediately have this block of houses surrounded to arrest us so we don't have much time to lose. Meanwhile Raffles had taken in the surroundings a bit. Edward, let's go down through a skylight soon, like Baxter, said Charlie, a little anxiously. The excitement of the flight and the dangers to come had made him nervous. Laughing and calmly, Lord Lister replied. But my dear fellow, now I notice that you have not experienced such things much. If we crawl through a roof hatch and find all the doors closed, what then? No, but look, that fine lightning rod, it will serve us better. To go down on such a thin rod, asked Charlie, bewildered. Certainly my boy, take a good look where I'm staying, and come after me. Raffles had put on his thick automotive gloves and began to slide down. Charlie looked after him in horror. His heart stood still, and he believed he saw his friend fall down every moment. But what was that? Raffles had pressed himself against the bar with all his strength. One wave, and he had disappeared from the floor under the roof through an open window in a room. Charlie dared not believe his eyes, but there Raffles was already looking out, and cried half aloud to his friend, laughing. Come on, my boy come now. Charlie, however, was too nervous and slid on, past the window. Fortunately, a hook, which was supposed to hold the window open, caught him in his clothes, and tore his trouser leg from bottom to top. Fortunately, that kept him hanging, and Raffles managed to catch him by the left arm. The jerk almost made him fly out the window. But he had pressed his left shoulder firmly against the frame, and that gave him a firm grip. So Raffles saw that the danger was over he cried in good humor, to encourage Charlie. Not so hard, my boy. You mustn't want to be down before me, you have to go through here. With these words, he pulled him with a strong jerk into the room and set him on an armchair by the window. How can I thank you enough, you saved my life. Thank you too. Better not be angry that I have put you in such danger, but it was no different. Let me see your leg. John Raffles examined the leg by the light of his flashlight, it turned out to be badly scraped. That could have been worse, in three days the weather will be better. Except my pants, replied Charlie, laughing. That will come to pass, but we must now first see where we actually are. Raffles lit the room. 
It was apparently a young mate's sleeping quarters. The door to the adjoining room was open, and Raffles convinced himself that it was the living and working room. A pair of boxing gloves and dictation papers betrayed that the resident was a student. Returning to the bedroom, Raffles noticed Charlie cooling his leg wound with water. Well done. Now we'll see if you can find suitable trousers here. In the wardrobe Raffles found a pair of neat trousers, which fit Charlie exactly. The great unknown had meanwhile subjected the rest of the contents of the cupboard to a closer inspection. He hung an elegant skirt over the back of a chair, and dug a fine top from a hat box. Charlie, meanwhile, had his clothes back in order, and Raffles admonished. Now hurry up, Harry, get out of here. Since you are little known, you can leave the house without danger. Now position yourself in the street so as to keep an eye on the house. I must make both the driver and the criminal disappear. As soon as I look so good that I can show myself in good company, I'll come down. With these words he pushed Charlie out the door and slammed the bolt on it from within. Then he rushed like the wind to put on the student's clothes. When he was done, he looked in the mirror and nodded in satisfaction. No mortal would recognize in the elegant young man he saw in the mirror either the Stonebridge Park thug type or the rooftop fleeting chauffeur. Raffles quickly went to the writing table, took a ten-pound bill from his wallet, and laid it on the writing table with a piece of paper on which he had scribbled a few words. Baxter had entered a girl's room through the skylight, which was cluttered with all kinds of junk. He could barely move. He tried to unscrew the screws that held the lock from the inside. He was saddened, however, to find that the room was very well closed. A thick iron bar sat across the door. Baxter could not think of breaking that rod, as he had not one tool with him, nor did he find anything among the mess that he could use as a crowbar. So the inspector was in a well-insured prison. He cursed, raged and screamed. In his anger he threw a heavy object on the ground, perhaps to lure the inhabitants upstairs by the noise. But it didn't matter. When he had toiled and made noise for five minutes, he saw the futility of his efforts and gave up. It looks like a deaf and dumb institution here. He cursed and tried to reach the roof hatch again. After a few minutes he was back on the roof. Now I'm just as far as before, he growled. The guys must have escaped by now. He crawled to the next roof hatch to seek refuge there. Now he was luckier. He was able to remove the screws from the door without much effort and was on the stairs in a few moments. No sooner was the inspector out in the street than he let his signal whistle. Agents rushed from all sides, and Baxter gave his orders with great calculation. He immediately ordered telephone calls in all directions, and in a short time the whole block of houses, where Baxter thought the fugitives must have been hiding, was surrounded. Baxter with three agents would investigate the first houses himself. He had just arrived at the top floor of one of the houses and was about to climb the stairs to the attic, when a door opened and a slenderly built gentleman came out. In his dress suit, with the top hat, he made a very distinguished impression. Pressing the buttons on his glacé gloves, he asked Baxter. Well, Mr. Inspector, what is there to do here? Not a chimney fire, I hope? No, replied Baxter examining the stranger sharply. Two burglars have fled over the roofs, which must have been hiding in one of these houses. Is it possible? asked Raffles, for it was none other than him. I have heard no life at all. But perhaps it is because I have been working at my writing table for a few minutes. Well, in any case, I wish you the best of luck. Goodbye. He lifted the hat for a moment, then went downstairs. Baxter saw a nameplate on the door, Percy Olden, Juridisk Study. So, so, a student, murmured Baxter, and followed his loudmouths, who had meanwhile searched the attic, the inspector returned dejectedly. At this moment a blond young man arrived. With amazement he saw the police at his door, but he took the key from his pocket and wanted to go inside. To his surprise, however, the lock was not closed. What is that now? He cried in surprise, have they broken into my house? That question hit Baxter like an electric shock. He pushed the young man aside and stormed into the room. In the middle of the room was a pile of clothes. On the writing table, Baxter saw a sheet of paper, the letters looked familiar to him. Like a panther he threw himself on the paper. Dear sir. I was compelled, in your absence, to invoke your hospitality. As I regretted that I also needed some clothes from you, I politely request that you accept this £20 note as compensation. John C. Raffles. In a trembling voice, Baxter read the note half aloud. 
Mahom and the other officers who had come in with the young student roared with laughter. With a grim look at Mahom, who held his hands to his sides with laughter, he slumped into a chair. Now he knew who had so kindly wished him good luck. Charlie had at once entered an opposite bar, from which he could see the door of the house from which Raffles was to appear. To his horror he saw the police cordon off the whole block, and also noticed that Baxter was just entering that house. The few visitors who were in the bar stood in the door and wondered what the police display might mean. Thus Charlie found an unsought opportunity, standing between them, to watch the house entrance. Since Baxter had been in for a long time without Raffles showing up, Charlie became concerned about his friend's care, and wanted to go back into the house to look for him. At that moment an elegant gentleman came out, quietly sampled the officer posted at the entrance, and then turned right. Charlie had recognized his friend, and was now trying to leave the bar without drawing attention. Raffles strolled slowly down the street, turned into a cross street, and stopped in front of a shop window, looking. He looked at the display with full attention until Charlie was back with him. Thank God you're back here healthy and in one piece, she whispered. But Charlie, what do you want? I find such a small yacht very refreshing, especially if you have the opportunity to play a trick on the cunning Baxter. As an empty cab passed them, they called for the coachman, and were driven to the station, Raffles recounting his latest adventure along the way. But now I believe, Charlie, it is advisable to leave London for a while. Methinks we should try to get to Dover, and find a ship there that will take us to the Indies. We must look for the treasure. If we're lucky, we'll be back in a few months, and I'll be able to annoy my best friend Baxter again. I must confess to you that I am glad to be able to leave London, at least for a while. I'm just afraid it won't be so easy. If Baxter finds out we've been to that house, he won't look any further without keeping an eye on all the stations. Who knows what this eventful day will bring us. You are way too heavy lifting, Charlie. I bet you we'll steam to Calais tomorrow. Of course we must move forward. If I remember, the night express train to Dover leaves at this time. Under such conversations, our friends have reached the station. The maid handed Charlie his baggage ticket, but was surprised to learn that two large suitcases were to be carried in the carriage as hand luggage. Meanwhile Raffles had taken tickets and inquired when the train was leaving. This one left in six minutes. So they just had time to have their luggage transferred and to find a good place. Raffles tipped the conductor to ensure that no other passengers entered the compartment. No sooner had each one gone to his corner than the train took off. A sigh of relief passed over Charlie's lips. Raffles, however, laughed, lit a cigarette, and said. I believe that tip will have an effect, we will no doubt not be disturbed until tomorrow. By the way, you will be right, Baxter will telegraph to stop us at Dover so we must disappear. To disappear? Yes, I wanted that too. But how? It will be soon, Charlie. Help me open this suitcase. And so it happened, and Raffles took from the trunk a razor, a saucer, a brush, and paste. Do you want to shave now? asked Charlie amazed. No, but I want to shave you. Charlie didn't understand, but Raffles continued. Yes, yes. Your pride must fall for our safety. Come here, my son. I do not understand. That's not necessary either, you will see on. A born hairdresser, Raffles shaved his friend, who now made a very youthful impression. Then he searched further in the trunk and took from it the dress for a young girl, a sports cap, and a little blonde wig. So, my boy, now you're going to be my daughter. Please. I will help you. Charlie broke out into a loud laugh. Under the practiced hand of his friend, he was soon transformed into a lovely blonde girl. The great unknown himself put on a great grey collar, and a ditto wig gave him a dignified appearance. He hid his clear viewers behind blue glasses. You see, Charlie, how good it is to have all your comedy stuff with you, Raffles joked. We will now lighten our luggage a little and pack your clothes, as well as the students. With these words, Raffles opened a window and threw away the garments, saying, Perhaps a poor devil will find them, and take pleasure in them. When Baxter found the note on the desk, he considered what he should do. He sent telegrams to the police stations of the stations with the description of Raffles as a student. Then he took an automobile and, following in in a hunch, went to the main station. His telegram had already arrived there and he found that his husband had taken two first-class tickets to Dover. Those are the rascals. 
With that exclamation Baxter rushed onto the platform and could just see the red lights disappear from the train. Looks like those fellows have an alliance with the devil, he complained. Now they will not escape me, however. The telegraph is faster than the railway, and now I am sure they're on that train. Immediately, after hearing all the witnesses, he drew up an official report. The rascals would no longer miss him. He went to the telegraph office with his head raised to deliver his service telegram. All stations where the train stopped were warned. He signaled more eloquently to Dover, announcing that he was coming on the next train. He would not be deprived of the triumph of personally transporting Raffles to London. Proud of his sure victory, and convinced of his infallibility, he went to the waiting room to await the next Dover train. There was a great commotion on the platform of the port city. A large crowd of police had lined the platform. Anyone who had come to collect his family from the train was not allowed on the platform today, they had to stay behind the fence. Two inspectors in particular acted weightily and gave the final clues. The public did not understand what was going on, and the most adventurous rumors circulated. One spoke of the Negus of Abyssinia, another of a strange animal game, a third of a train of nihilists and elongated whistle sounds, and the London night train entered the station. Even before the train came to a stop, the officers jumped onto the running boards. All stay seated, no one alight. Doors closed. It sounded everywhere. The train master and the conductor got out and were interrogated by one of the inspectors. The conductor had seen two gentlemen who matched the description, and said he had been tipped with a request to leave the gentleman alone as far as Dover. The inspector beckoned two men, showed himself to the compartment and went inside. The compartment was empty. The officers looked at each other and the conductor in astonishment. You must have made a mistake in the compartment? The inspector rasped the conductor. That is absolutely impossible, sir. I am sure both gentlemen in London boarded here. Oh, what nonsense, you must be mistaken. They can't have made themselves invisible, or have flown out. We'll have to search the whole train. Forward. Three men in the first chariot and three in the last it will go faster. Every corner of the carriages was carefully searched. That was quite easy, as they were side aisle carriages. When the six officers met in the middle of the train, they found that the search had been fruitless. No one had been seen who matched the description. The passengers grew impatient. Many an unkind word was heard. Once again the train was searched, but when that did not help either, the inspectors had to decide, against their will, to let the people leave. The crowd so long held up pressed forward, and very soon the platform was empty. A young girl stepped out of one of the rear carriages, who was helpful to an old gentleman. He must have had very bad eyesight, for he had almost fallen to the ground when he got out. Willingly, one of the officers had fired and helped him. Thank you very much, said the old man, looking round at a porter. Since there was none around, the officer said. Shall I hand you the trunk? Without waiting for an answer, he had already entered the compartment and put the suitcase on the platform, which was not easy for him, for the suitcase appeared to be quite heavy. Thank you again, sir, said the old gentleman kindly. Not thanks, replied the policeman, who looked at the little girl with an enamoured look. At last two porters came and took charge of the trunk. Greeting the helpful agent kindly, the old gentleman withdrew slowly, guided with care by his daughter. The policeman saluted, and looked longingly after the nice girl. When the old gentleman and his daughter had left the station, they immediately took a carriage to the harbour. The Raffles was delighted to hear that within half an hour the French steamer Menidal would be making the return journey to Calais. As there were still two cabin seats open, our friends discussed them for themselves. Thank God, Charlie whispered to Lord Lister, that's how far we are, if only the ship goes to sea soon. Actually we are already safe old boy, because according to international law we are here on French territory. At this moment a great noise arose in the dock. The captain was called, and all that was on deck moved forward. Thus the two friends remained unnoticed. Raffles grabbed Charlie's hand and pulled him into the cabin. His keen eye had on the dock, gesticulating violently, Baxter discovers. He had arrived in Dover on the next train, a so-called follower train. When the inspectors told him that they had found no one, his fury seemed to have no end. He had now counted on the victory so firmly. He scolded his colleagues violently, and hinted that such a thing would not have happened to a London policeman. Suddenly his face brightened. 
He had heard from the porter in London that the trunks were very heavy and very large. One had two yellow names, and on the other was a brass plate marked IR-12. Now the gallant policeman suddenly remembered that the suitcases he himself had lifted from the train fit this description. Then those two were also the wanted ones. Cried Baxter, those scoundrels have changed their clothes again. Triumphantly he continued the pursuit, proud that through his sleuthing he had rediscovered the trail of the wanted. Baxter understood very well that they would choose a ship of foreign nationality. The captain did not like the interference of foreign police, and as Baxter had no orders from the French envoy, he objected. I cannot help you. We sail away in three minutes. If you like, you can go with me to Calais. What you want to do there is none of my business, but on the ship all the passengers are under my care, and I have neither appetite nor time to check your statements. And here the old sailor remained. Baxter, foaming at the mouth with rage, wanted at least to persuade the captain to leave the ship at anchor until it had been searched and the fugitives found. But the captain did not, and sounded the steam whistle for the second time. The passengers liked Baxter's affectation, and the sympathies were with the old gentleman and his daughter. They looked back at them, but they were gone. The third signal for the departure was blown, the gangway was overtaken, at the last moment Baxter came running, with a ticket for the steerage deck, he still jumped on the plank, which was already floating in the air, fell on his stomach, and was like a frog on a plank, brought aboard. When Charlie got into the cabin, Raffles whispered to him. Now it is important to be prepared for all events, otherwise we will be lost so close to the target. You have to take off those annoying women's clothes. I will put everything, money, jewels, and essentials in this watertight bag, and take off all superfluous clothing. We must be able to move completely unhindered. Since everything was on deck, our friends could change into their cabins in peace. It happened in feverish haste, and in a few minutes Raffles and Charlie were very lightly clothed. Now go on, Charlie, leave everything lying there, there's nothing left to save. We have to think about our own safety. With these words both left the hut, and descended the stairs which led to the lower holds. No sooner was the ship moving than Baxter began his pursuit. Unable to count on the captain's help, he turned to a steward. The latter showed him the hut discussed by the old gentleman and the young girl. If Baxter had still doubted, all doubts were now cast aside for certainty. He found the girl's costume and a blonde wig. He held it up like a victory trophy and showed them some of the passengers who had accompanied him. This manhunt was regarded as a pleasant diversion, and volunteers from all sides offered themselves to Baxter. He chose four passengers, begging the rest not to interfere with him. Baxter rightly suspected that the fugitives were hiding in the lower holds, and the five lords descended there as well. First the large hold where the coal lay was searched carefully. No corner was unobserved. In fact, it seemed preposterous, with such pomposity as Baxter walked about, as if he were looking for mice and not two grown men. In the whole hold was nothing but a mountain of coals that reached to the farthest corner. In the back of the corner lay some coal sacks. After Baxter had pierced space with a falcon's eye ten times, he left this place. The four gentlemen followed him, in all manner of wits. At this moment some coals rolled down from the corner where the sacks lay. Looking up, one of the gentlemen said. It is horrible that there are always so many rats on these ships. The troops started moving, now to search the other holds. When the party was gone for a few minutes, the bags seemed to move. The rats were definitely dancing. Coles rolled down again and a head cautiously peered out behind it. That worked. Get out of here quickly, one floor up, whispered Raffles to his comrade. One, two, three they were up the ladder. Raffles took a small but sharp telescope from the pocket and looked at the horizon. In the distance he saw the sail of a fishing vessel, which seemed to have a course similar to the Manidal, in the opposite direction. There, Charlie, there comes our rescue, said Raffles, pointing him to the sea. At this moment the voices of the five gentlemen were heard below, coming up. Swift as lightning, Raffles withdrew into a corner, behind rolls of ship's rope, and Charlie immediately followed his friend. The pursuers went right past them, one actually stopped and lit his cigarette just in front of the scrolls. Their hearts stopped for both refugees, they did not dare to breathe any more. Finally the last one went away, and when all was quiet Raffles came forward. I am weary of this eternal hunt, he whispered to Charlie. Now it's life or death. 
In the meantime he had reached the window from which he had previously observed the fish spider spider. This one, meanwhile, had come much closer. Raffles worked his way through the opening and then plunged into the depths, followed instantly by Charlie. Both good swimmers, they steered towards the fisherman, and as this had wind and current with it, he shot through the waves like a gauge. The stoker of the Manidal had just entered the coal hold. To his amazement he saw a white note in the middle of the coals, with the inscription. To Police Inspector Baxter. On his pursuit, he came back into the coal hold and with a grin the stoker handed him the note. Baxter read with an angry expression, Dear Lord Baxter. I hope you enjoy your trip to Calais. This time it was wrong again. I am traveling abroad for a while, to pick up a treasure, but comfort you, I'll be back, 